Welcome to episode number 11 of Oil Painting Question and Answers. Uh, before we get to the questions, I want to talk about some misconceptions about value in oil paintings. It's an extremely important topic. It's probably the number one issue that I see arise in my students' work. Um, after I've, you know, if they've taken a workshop from me and they go on to paint, this is the, the mistake that, that I see over and over again. So it's very important. Um, I'm going to be showing some screenshots from a, a, a great movie that I like to illustrate some points and also be showing some oil paintings. Um, but before I do that, let me, and, and by the way, it's very important that you watch this in full screen mode because we're going to be uh, doing some the demos and the, the um, examples that I'm going to be showing. It just doesn't work unless you're in full screen mode because of all the white background around uh, on a web page if you're not watching the full screen mode. So please stop the video or go ahead and, and run it in full screen mode uh, before we go any further. But let me tell you a story um, or tell you some, an experience that I, ha I see over and over again. What happens is the students, they'll take my workshop or they're doing the course online and they're working from life. And when they're working from life, they're using their color checker and they're painting with the actual colors that they see in front of them and doing everything right. And then when they're finished, let's say they've taken my workshop, they, they get home, I ship them their painting, and they uh, tell me, they pull it out of the box, put it in their living room, and they decide that the painting looks way too dark. And they call me up and they say, boy, the painting just really looks dark. You know, when I had it in your uh, studio, it looked good, but now it just looks dark and dingy, and you know, what's going on? And how can I fix it, or you know, how can I uh, remedy this? And so what I tell them is, is that um, what I teach people to do is to paint for museum quality lighting. And that's really important because if they take that painting that looks dark in their living room or in their kitchen or wherever they're looking at it, and they take it and bring it into my studio or into a uh, museum where the lighting is very good, the painting's not going to look dark. It's going to look fantastic. And so the only remedy to that, if you want your paintings to look bright in a dark room, is to just overexpose them and just bring up all your values. But the problem with doing that is it might look a little, it might look better in a dark room, but the moment you put it back in a museum quality lighting or in, in your studio lighting, now everything's blown out and it's overexposed and your colors are all wrong. And so you really have to paint for museum quality lighting. And that's really important. It's what every, all the old uh, masters, all the old the paint, painters from history have always worked from life and they've always judged their color from life and not from an overexposed photograph. So let me talk about how, uh, uh, show you some examples so that we can uh, get to the, to the bottom of this. So let's take a look at this uh, screenshot from the movie Rushmore by Wes Anderson. Um, and this shot has been balanced correctly. Uh, Wes Anderson really knows what he's doing and this is a fantastic, perfect exposure in my opinion. This is the same kind of exposure that you would see in an old painting painted 200 years ago. It's just wonderful. And, um, and by the way, if your computer monitor is you know, pumped up real high where your exposure is blown out and your saturation's off, and especially if you're watching this on a TV and you have factory settings, um, you're going to be seeing this even brighter than it really is if you were to see it in a movie theater. But if you have a balanced monitor, um, this looks like it did in the movie theater when you would go see it. And so the first thing to notice about this uh, image is let's look at some uh, spots here. And if we look at this place on the couch, and I've got a white dot in the middle of that color, that color, the reddish color, is taken right, it's sampled exactly right from the couch, and then I've put a white dot in the middle so that you can see just how far uh, it is from, from white and how much darker it is from white. And this is where the couch is being lit. So now let's look at the wall behind. Again, it's over there where the lamp is. This is the lightest part of the wall. And yet, look how much darker it is than white paint or white uh, of the computer monitor. Now let's look at the front of the dog. Same thing. Even there where you might think you see white, it's actually quite a bit darker than white and not even near being blown out. 
the light part of his face, same thing. It's quite a bit darker than white paint. If you look at this teacup, even on the, ref the light side of the teacup, where, it, where it's being lit the most, it's still far, far from white. And now let's go into the lamp. Even inside the lamp, in the very brightest part that's right next to the light bulb, that's the only place where it really approaches being white. And uh, in your, on your computer monitor, if it's uh, overexposed, which it may well be, this might actually appear to be white. But if you have a balanced display like mine, it's actually not even quite white. Same thing for this lamp over here. Now, if we look at the gold frame in the back, and you might think that a gold frame is glowing and that it's bright, well, as you can see, even the brightest part of that glowing gold frame is far from white. Same thing with the back of his collar. You might think it's light, but it, look at the white paint. You can see how much darker it is. And there's a few more examples here that you can look at, and you can see that all of these colors are actually nice and rich and far from white. Now, let me show you what happens if I bump the exposure up on this picture. And this is typically what you would see if you saw this image on the web page where somebody wanted to embed it into their blog, uh, it would likely be pumped up and the exposure would be much brighter than Wes Anderson intended for it to be. Now, if you start with this, and let's say that you have a picture that you've uploaded from your camera, and your camera's automatically pumped up the exposure like they often do, and if you see this first, and then I tell you that the right exposure is this, which this is back to the right exposure, you can see how dark it looks and it's really jarring to your eye and you think there's just no way it should be that dark. So it's really hard to go from bright like this and then go into Photoshop and try to adjust the exposure. It's very hard to bring yourself to darken it as much as it should be like this. But now let's go the other way. Let's look at it too dark. And if I start with this, and you look at this for a moment, and you pull, it, pull this into your Photoshop or off of your camera, and it's too dark, and I tell you to bring it up to the right level, like this, this is back to the right level, now it looks good. So it really makes a difference what direction you're moving. So let's take a look at this next screenshot here from the same movie, and notice that even in the background, the, uh, in the window, the things are not overexposed. And again, if we take this screenshot here and I show it to you overexposed like this first, in other words, let's say you pull this into your computer and you've taken this picture, and if you see this first, it's going to be very hard for you to bring it down as dark as you need to, like it is here. This is the proper exposure. But if we start dark and look at it too dark first and then bring it up, then it looks good. Now let's go back to the overexposed shot. And notice how, if we look at all the colors that we looked at before, look how different they look and how bright they are and how much less saturation there is in it. And now let's compare the various colors in the overexposed shot to those same colors in the properly exposed shot. And as you can see, there's a huge difference in the color level, the saturation, and, the, and how the colors look. So let's take a look at this next screenshot here. And in this particular shot, there's a lot of mood lighting. The uh, fire is burning in the back. There's a lamp sitting on the mantel. There's a white tablecloth. But if we take this shot and pump it up like you would typically see it on the internet, now to your eye, you might think that brighter looks better, especially if you start with the bright and then go back to the dark like this. But again, if we go to the dark, and we look at this first, then we have no problem d deciding that the proper exposure looks good. So here's a shot of Bill Murray outside with a barbershop behind him. So you'll notice that even the lights inside the barbershop are not blown out white. And let's just go through and look at some other colors in this. Every one of these colors, take a look at how far they are from white, even the, even the Christmas lights in the window. Um, but they, again, if we start with this overexposed shot and see this first, it's going to be really hard for you to, to decide that this proper exposure is what looks best. But now let's compare all the colors that we see, saw in the properly exposed shot 
and now look at the, those same colors in the overexposed shot. And you can see how much more wonderful the color is in the properly exposed shot. So how does this apply to artwork and to paintings? Um, let me tell you a little story about, um, you know, I you know, go to museums like every, every lover of art does, and I've always seen all the great artwork like Sing John Singer Sargent and, you know, Rubens and, and Rembrandt. I've always seen that artwork in museum quality lighting under bright lights. And um, what I did was I did a portrait of a, of a lady and uh, if you saw the movie, Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil, it's a be be big, beautiful home. And I was to do a portrait in, in the house and painted this big, large, full-length painting. And when I was walking around the house, it was full of all these, you know, in incredible antiques and pieces of history. And there was a big sergeant painting over the mantel. And then in the kitchen, there was a Rubens painting. And the thing that struck me was just how dark they looked. I could hardly even see the sergeant painting. It wasn't in a museum. It was just over a mantle, crammed up against the ceiling, and it wasn't lit properly. And it was so dark, I couldn't believe it. I really, I mean, it, was, it wasn't, it didn't even look like a sergeant painting. The Rubens painting, which is in the kitchen, was incredibly dark. It was so dark I could hardly make it out. And yet it had that quality of, you know, real artwork because it was there on these old walls with the big heavy molding and it just all kind of worked. But as far as viewing that painting, it really needed, in order to see it properly, it really needed museum quality lighting, big bright lights over it at the right angle without a bunch of glare all over the surface. But that's the difference. And if they were to like, you know, change those paintings, and if Sargent were to, you know, paint it, painting that was much brighter and more overexposed and perhaps looked good in those dark rooms, uh, and then you move that same painting into, the, into a museum quality lighting, it would look horrible. The color saturation wouldn't be there. The wonderful colors that he used would all be washed out. So you really have to paint your paintings like Sargent did, like Rubens did, like Rembrandt did for museum quality lighting and just not worry about trying to you know, make your painting look bright in dingy dark light. It just can't be done. You have to pick one or the other. Let's take a look at this painting by Henrietta Brown. And this is a photograph that we found of this painting that we feel is a good exposure. It's not blown out. Typically, if you just go and look up uh, images on the internet or even in art books, they're overexposed and blown out. But this is an image that, that is a, a good uh, example of what the artist really did. And if we look at the colors, if you look at the color on the shoulder, they're the white shirt. You can see it's far from white. If you look at the side of her face, not anywhere near white. If you look at the wall behind her, not anywhere near white, or even the paper on the desk. So the old masters and the artists that worked from life uh, throughout history just never expo overexposed or blew out the light parts of their paintings. So how can you be sure that you're taking photographs that are properly exposed and not blown out and overexposed and that your colors are good and rich? And the first thing is to uh, always take a good photograph to begin with and don't take photographs that are really blown out. If it's even better to have an exposure that's slightly too dark rather than, than overexposed. Uh, but when you pull the image into Lightroom off of your camera, uh, the very first thing to do is to not look at it overexposed to begin with, and, but to rather uh, take the exposure slider and slide it down to the point where your image looks too dark to you on screen. So let's look at this picture here of a still life that I took. And I took this with a, in a, it's a raw image. R-A-W, that's a file type and that's important. It gives me the most range and the most ability to adjust the exposure. So the best way to try to get a good exposure when you're developing your prints to, to paint from, just move the exposure slider all the way to one side so it's nice and dark. And then allow your brain to look at this for a minute. Uh, you know, go get a drink, come back, you know, give yourself a minute to look at it in this dark exposure and then start sliding the slider up and, it's, and then stop at that point when you think the exposure's right. And if you do it that way, you almost always, I mean, I do it myself, I'll almost always start at a much darker exposure than I would if I would have uh, come from overexposed and trying to uh, bring it down to the proper exposure. So that's the lesson to be learned. 
to help you avoid overexposing your pictures and blowing out all your colors to make your paintings have colors that are natural, just like you would see if you, this still life were sitting in front of you. Now, if you're working from life and you're using a color checker, you don't have to worry about blowing out your whites or, or getting your values right because when you, before you even begin to paint, you're going to make sure that your color checker is in the same amount of light as your subject. And if long, as long as that's true, you're never going to blow out your whites or overexpose the, the bright parts of your painting. So, uh, you know, that's, that's one of the reasons I recommend working from life because you're just, you don't have to deal with any of this overexposed photograph issues that you would uh, if you're working from photographs. So that's it for today's lesson. Now let's get into some questions. I really enjoyed the episode that discussed the work and style of Sargent and Repin, which is quite loose. Do you feel that Sargent worked more rapidly than you do? Um, I think he certainly did work more uh, rapidly than I do, um, but I'm not sure about that. I don't know exactly. I think in some ways he might have um, from the experience, from the story that I read, and this is somebody who I think writing a letter about their sister or niece being painted and watching uh, Sargent work, but he was very much more about brush preparation and thinking about what color he wanted to go right there in the neck or whatever it was, and really gave a lot of uh, thought to his color on his palette and what what was brush uh, was going to be loaded with, and then he would. Uh, paint, but his actual painting time would be very uh, much more, um, uh, you know, wouldn't, be, wouldn't spend hardly any time painting, but do a lot more in his brush preparation. But uh, Sargent was painting at a level that is, you know, well beyond what I ever achieved, and I think that he was an absolute master um, at what, at the style that, that he painted. You know, when I worked my, almost my whole career, I worked from photographs. So it was a, a different thing. I started off working from life, and when I work from life, I'm, I don't even pencil. I just dash it in and you know, put my big blocky values in and then kind of build it in like that. But the method that I teach on drawmixpaint.com is really more for people who are just starting out or people who are, uh, maybe have a lot of experience but are uh, relearning the fundamentals. And so I highly recommend, if you don't have a lot of experience in uh, following the course on drawmixpaint.com that's very, you know, step by step and checking things and using a color checker constantly and using a proportional divider. Um, but in my own personal paintings, I don't uh, paint that way. Um, but, uh, so, but in general, I think Sargent was, was much more, uh, you know, at a, in a different league than I was in terms of painting. A, a quick portrait from life um, because I work from, from portraits my whole career uh, just for practical reasons. It was really very difficult to get people to sit for me uh, for the length of time that I needed. You know, it was a different era when Sargent painted and that was uh, something that people did and it was understood. Uh, it was part of the culture uh, for people to have, you know, sit for their portraits. And today, if you tell people, you know, can you sit for me for four hours a day for uh, five days, you know, they, th that's too much. And so it's just a different time. And, I, and, and just as far as the practicality of it, uh, I could go and take pictures and then come back and take my own time and work in my studio, and not have to have a model that I was dealing with all the time. But it was just a, it's just a different experience to work from a photograph and to work from life. And when I'm working from life, it's much more quick and, and you know, laying in bold uh, values and then refining it and it's a, it's a different process uh, than working from, from life or rather from photographs. I paint full time and started noticing pain and swelling in my hand after long days of work. Is this normal? Do you have any tips to avoid this? I don't know if that's normal um, or how common that is. Um, I know that you know my wife gets a carpal tunnel from using a computer mouse, and everybody's different. Um, and so, in my own experience, the, I, I uh, have never had any uh, pain in my wrists or anything like that. Uh, my one thing that did happen to me was I uh, tore a ligament in my shoulder, and literally just couldn't hold my arm up without severe pain. And so, what I did was I took a couple pulleys and I put one pulley straight over the general area where I would hold my arm and I put a big uh, belt 
you know, lo loosely around my wrist or a sling, a, a fabric sling. And then I tied it to a rope and it went up to a pulley and then over to another pulley and then down and I had a milk jug that I filled, a big gallon size uh, container that I would fill with water. And I would put just the right amount of water in the milk gallon to balance my arm so that essentially my arm would be floating in space and it wouldn't cause me any pain and then I would be able to paint like that. So, But I think that was probably different than pain in the hand and I don't know how that would help you but it may help uh, uh, some of you who might have shoulder pain or something. Have you found a certain size painting sells better than another? In your experience, do galleries tend to prefer larger pieces to showcase? Um, I think that, you know, it probably depends on the exact market and, and you know, the different cities. But in general, you know, there's going to be a certain size painting, you know, that's, that's going to sell, they're going to sell more of because there's more demand for that size or whatever for it to fill walls in people's homes. Um, but I personally, as an artist, I always like to have at least, you know, one or two really large paintings that, that have an impact. So that even if uh, you know you, they have a big show, you're not just showing a whole series of paintings that are this size. You know you have some that are massive. I mean, I, I would even do paintings that were you know fill a whole wall. You know, um, but that and and then people can come and they can see that, and, they, and it may not be the painting that they buy, but it sort of uh, helps establish your repu or your reputation as a serious artist. Um, and, you know, large paintings are a lot of fun to do. I've always enjoyed uh, doing them, but I think it's really uh, maybe, as you say, as a showcase piece, but um, not necessarily one that would sell, although I have sold very large paintings. So I really don't know for sure what sells the best, but that's just my, those are my general thoughts about it. I live in an apartment that has fairly low walls in the basement, and my setup means I have light coming from my right shoulder. What do you suggest? What I would suggest, if, you're, if your ceiling is really low and, and so you can't get your light up high enough, instead of having it directly behind you, uh, just put it off to one side. And you can experiment and see which, which side works better for you, but if you just put it, say, three feet to your left or three feet to your right where it can come in and hit your palette or hit your painting, if, if the light's off to one side, it's going to hit your painting and then bounce off that way and you won't have any glare but you're just going to have to move it around and see what works best. What are your thoughts about color charts? Are they really useful or can I match my color by using just the color checker? You certainly can match your color just by using a color checker. Um, it's actually what I recommend. The very best color charts I think are the ones that you see in the world around you. You know, you can uh, sit somebody in a chair in your living room and if you have a red rug on the floor and there's a green tree outside and the lights coming through the window and then there's a, you know, a, a, a yellow painted kitchen off to one side, that color chart that results on their skin is going to be completely unique to just that room. And it doesn't, there is no specific, you know, it's not as if you take somebody and then put them in a white room and light them with 5000K light and make sure all their clothes are white or black so that no, nothing influences it. And even if you could mix a color chart from a laboratory a setting like that, you know, it wouldn't be natural, it wouldn't be as exciting and, and uh, as varied and, and as dynamic as natural colors are. So I think the very best way in the world to, to learn about color is to just mix those color charts that you see in the world around you. And there's an infinite variety of them. And when I first started painting, um, I was very tempted, you know, I would come up with a, I would uh, go and mix. I always mix my colors from life. Even before I invented the color checker, I would just use my brush and close one eye and match my colors like that. And when I used to do that, um, I was always tempted to save really special colors that I that I had mixed. You know, I would paint a portrait and I would think, oh, I really like these colors, and I, I was tempted to put them on a piece of paper, and then so I could come back and remix them later. And I didn't do that specifically because I didn't want to be reliant on any formulas. I didn't want my work to start fitting into a certain mold and I thought I should just learn about it naturally. And so I just continued to, you know, 
mix my colors from life and I was always uh, surprised at all these new sort of color combinations that I would come come up with but it wasn't me it was just the fact that I was going to all these different you know settings whether it was out in somebody's garden or in a kitchen or whatever and it was just completely different every time and so that was what I learned from mixing colors from life was that there was no standard there was no specific you know uh, color chart that met any situation other than you know perhaps one so it's really varied and so I highly recommend working uh, from life and using a color checker to learn about color well that's it for today's show thank you so much for watching I wanted to mention to you that I'm going to be doing more painting demonstrations and, and producing more tutorials. We may not have the question and answer series every week, but we will have a video every week that comes out on typically a Thursday or Friday. And so we're gonna just be mixing it up more and not having the question and answer series every week, but doing more painting demonstrations and more tutorials. Uh, but if you have a question for me for the next question and answer uh, episode, episode 12, leave it in the comment section of this video and I'll get to as many of those questions as I can in the next episode. Uh, thanks so much for watching.